Spencer Lewis here with you for InsideTrackNews.com. We're back for Bench Racing Volume 6. Now to assemble some of the finest young talent I can on the limited budget that we have on this show, which is zero, volunteer basis only. Without further ado, to my left, former Sunset Speedway Superstock Track Champion, third generation racer, 17 years of age, fine purveyor of extra medium sized shirts, young Lane, Lane Zardo. Next to Lane, Mac DeMann. At the time of this filming, he's a four time Lucas Oltik Ucana midget feature winner. By the time you see it, he might have added a couple of more, but he's having a hell of a season. And way over on the left there, it is the Aaron Express Davy Terry, everybody's favorite Oscar modified tour driver. Not getting paid for this? You're not getting paid. I'm sorry, but it's too late now. We're filming. Here we go. First off, I want to start. I want to start by thanking you guys for coming. Three incredibly young, incredibly well, in Dave's case, relatively young, incredibly talented drivers representing three very different styles of racing. I mean, I want to start off by talking about the youth movement in Ontario. How strong is Ontario right now for drivers under the age of 25? Is it getting better? You know, do we have a lot to look forward to? Do we have a lot to be excited about? Lane, set us off. It's crazy. I mean, I can name at least five not only people that are on each division, but five extremely well people that are in each division. Like my class, I got Caden in last division. I got myself. And I got people who are just starting out in mini stock. We got uh, Jake Watson, Lambro, Brandon McCarran, one of my good buddies in three divisions. We got Mac. We got one of my other buddies, Tyler Turnbull, out of Racine. Brent Hawkins, just Brent Hurricane, they did in Modified. We got Davey, Brent, myself, and like across all different divisions. A lot of the top runners are under the age of 25. Yeah, I think, uh, like especially in our series, a lot of the guys I race against are getting getting old. They've been in it for, like David Bale has been in it for 25 years. It's 25th straight season with the club. And uh, he's seen the cars progress and everything. And a lot of drivers, like Rob Neely, he's got um, Adam Racine and uh, Ryan Frazier and his two uh, personally old cars trying to get the next generation of Canada Midget Club started. I mean, I think a lot of clubs, like you said, you name a lot of those young stars that are racing in Sunset and Flamborough. And, uh, yeah, I think uh, young drivers are actually making a, making a name for themselves and we're starting to see a lot more of them pop up. And uh, we're going to see a lot more of them. It's, it's good for the fans, too. I mean, like, when you, when you go to Sunset, you got the, the two best runners in the Lincoln Hall division. You got most old school guy, Tom Walters, great for probably 45 years, I'm guessing, 30 championship. And then you got Mike Bentley, one of the more younger guys in the series. I think he's like 22, 23. So you got one of the most wisest oldest people, a, a legend, not even a legend of the Hall of Fame. And yet on many occasions, Bentley's been Walter's kryptonite. He's been the anti-Walters, and, and you know the, the fan base is, is so divided. You're absolutely right. It's, it's a multi-generational type feel when you, when you send to the From the corner four to the checkered flag stand is Bentley. From uh, corner one to the flag stand, that's all Walters. And the beer garden is just wild. It's, just, it's, yeah. it's wide open. I've, I've, I don't want to say I've spent a lot of time in the beer garden, but <laughs> you spend your fair share of time in the beer garden. <laughs> but usually when I stand down there, it's it's vocal. Yeah, you, you definitely know who everyone's cheering for. Every series and every track has their their old guys and their new guys. We got Rob Neely and Todd Crespo and Corey Mosker and myself and Adrian Stalling. And you're always going to have that competition, and it's always good for the fans to be able to bring their kids out and have, see younger drivers like ourselves and uh, driving. And it, 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 uh, Help the kids relate. So, Davey, with the Oscar Modified Tour, it's 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 very much in its infancy on its own. But is, is it providing an excellent opportunity right now for young drivers to make a mark for themselves? Absolutely, it's a stepping stone for the super late models. Um, like as of right now, we haven't had because the series is still new, relatively, and we haven't seen anyone make that jump yet. But that that's it. It might not be its direct intention, but that's that's how it'll be. And it, the fact that the cars are widely available. You can you can pick them up for I mean racing is never cheap, but you can pick a good car up for a relatively affordable uh, uh, bill. Does that make it that much more enticing for a young driver to, to choose the Oscar Modified Tour? Yes it does and uh, the rules are so broad right at the moment that you can basically take anything and turn it into a modified. Like some guys like there's ex super late models that are now modified. Uh, last year Tim Burke drove a there's an OSS car. That they turned into a modified, so you can take anything really. 
bytes. I don't know. No, nobody yet has had. Like I guess. I don't know. Max is the first guy to actually go out and have a car purpose built for the current rule craft package. Max Bayor, by yeah. the way, shout out to Max Bayor. Um, and now everyone's seeing just how fast that car is going. I think now, from now on, and maybe even next year, you're going to see guys having cars built specifically for boxcar market. But when you get into guys purpose building chassis for this rule package, is that when you start to see the, the cost start to skyrocket? That's when it starts to go up. So Mac, the last, we'll say three seasons, very few tours, divisions, or clubs have been at, as good at developing young talent than the Lucas Oil T2 Canada Midgets. Why, why do you feel that is? I feel um, when I was in the karting world, the next stepping stone was sort of the, the Canada Midgets. I mean, they're like uh, Colin Turnbull and, uh, and my dad and stuff, they all had kids that karted together and they all uh, loved the TQ Midget Club growing up because it's sort of like an engineer thinking uh, who can, like, you, you fabricate everything yourself and build the chassis in the shop. And I mean, um, they always loved it for that standpoint to see their kids running. I think that's what they ultimately wanted to see. And uh, I don't know, I think the Hurricane Midgets are a pretty good stepping stone. Although they don't have like suspension, they're kind of like a go kart, a rigid frame and chassis. Uh, I think those those junior uh, mini trucks that Corey Moster ran at Grand Bend Speedway. I mean, you actually have to set the car up every week, and it's going to be different every week. I think that's a really good step. It goes, it goes in phases too. Like I know, like my generation at Waterloo, they all went vintage modified like Samantha Jensen, um, yeah, Shane Steckel, uh, Steve Trendle. Um, Yes, we buy into them. But Great, all old, old stuff. But like all those guys, that Joey was Atkinson. that was the trend at the time. Yeah. Was going vintage modified racing. But uh, I don't even know what it would be right now. I guess I guess it would be mini stock racing right now. I, I think if, if you were to really do the numbers and sort of try to calculate how many drivers under the age of 21 are racing right now, I think it, it would heavily be in favor of the mini stocks. Now, you went mini stock racing. Your first year was 2001. Yes. You're old. Lane went mini stock racing in 2008 at Flamborough. So you made the natural progression from the car club <laughs> to the mini stock division exactly the way Davey did just a couple of years later. What drew you, or I guess rather, what drew your grandfather and your team to the mini stock division over anything else you could have chosen at the time? Well, we kind of talked about like the kind of we had an option to go to the J cars. Um, or the junior cast cars, as they called. Uh, we had an option to go to Hurricane Ridges, and then the year after me, we'll go to DQ, they do. But uh, my brother went up to a Thunder car and raced at Flambro, so that's kind of the main reason for pulled me to a mini stock. But uh, we liked the mini stock because it was, it was a full size car, like not, not as fast as a suit like model, but it's a full size car. You have to do suspension, you, you, gotta, you gotta do like everything you gotta do to an actual race car. So it, it, it kind of helped me in getting prepared not just to drive a car but to work on it, to work on a full size car, to have to work everything to a full size car spec and to do all that stuff. Now obviously when Lane made the jump in 2008, the mini stock division was already established, it was already a popular jump off point for young drivers. In 2001, I mean the mini stock division was just barely getting started. Most tracks didn't even have a mini stock division. So when you made the progression of the cart of the carding ranks, why the mini stock division? Why did you not go the hobby route like so many other Waterloo uh, regional car club graduates uh, did? It was basically just cost and what we had available to us. Like the car, the car we bought just up the road. And I think we just, I think we dragged it back home with a pickup truck one night, and we just started, that, that sounds about right that, for, yeah, for you. Yeah. We uh, and just started thrashing on it. It, it took us it took us a while to build it, and we came out halfway through the year. It was actually the first year that Flamborough had the mini stock division and that's what we took it the most because it was close to home. And then uh, the other reason too is because when my dad and I were helping in um, Shaw Motorsports, we were running the All-Star Series and every track that the All-Star Series went to had a mini stock class. So we would take the mini stock along with us and so that's how we got to know all the different tracks. That's how it just, not running for points anywhere. The only downside is we had to start in the back of a lot of the tracks that we went to, but that's when you learn. Yeah, that could be a plus sign, right? Yeah. yeah. All the leader trade. So, a couple times we still managed to win at Peterborough from the back. So. Now, 
with the number of, of good, young, talented drivers that are in the, the Canada Midget ranks right now, Mac, are you able to look at a few of them or the majority of them as, as drivers that could potentially compete for championships down the road? Oh, for sure. I mean, I remember seeing a Tyler Turnbuller in the same spot I was in six years ago. I mean, I finished 11th in points or something my first year, first couple of years. I mean, and jumping in a can and out of a go-kart is not easy. I mean, you just got to learn to push the, power, push the pedal down and get off the gas earlier and earlier and earlier. And my first couple of years, I didn't know anything about the cars. I didn't know how to set them up or anything. I would go to the, the, the history book of the 15 years we've got history and say, what have we done in tracks in the past? But six years later, now you get a handle on the car and you can come off the track and say, okay, we have to do these three things and go back out for the car to be good. There's no better feeling. And I mean, these young drivers are just in the same position I was six years ago. And uh, it's, it's going to be crazy the, the stuff that they're going to accomplish in the next few years. Nothing teaches you car control like play car. Yeah. Like, it's, you got to know how to let some uh, set guys up yeah. and pass them three corners ahead of time. Even though in, major, in, in our racing, you might not think that's significant, but I mean, a TQ Midget might be a sprint, mini sprint car, but it's momentum. And if you get bogged down in one corner, exactly. it affects you for a lap. So uh, you got to be able to let off the gas and create that gap create, to be able to make it fast. You have to do it this fast with this much horsepower. You have to you have to make it work. And, and that's why, that's kind of the reason why I like the small crate, because it's kind of that same theory. And uh, you seem to make it work. So. Now, one of the, sorry, one of the downsides to karting that I've heard, you know, drivers and, and parents of drivers allude to is that karting has an innate ability to create bad habits. And when I say that, I mean, do you sort of share that mindset that, that a driver might be able to fall into some bad habits if they if they stay in the karting ranks maybe for too long before moving up? Yeah, but that's like everything, right? If you stay in the motor car for too long, you're going to drive. If I stay in the motor car, if anybody stays in the motor car for too long, when I move up to the late model for the first year, I'm not used to driving late model. I'm going to have that old house I would with the Thunder Car. If I went into driving in a DQ midget, I would drive other things like DQ midget and other So, yes and no. I mean, go kart is the best step. You get, you get to go into when you're a young kid. You don't have that much speed. So, you can really learn to uh, give a little, get a little, and not too much consequences on it a little bit. But uh, I'd say after about five years, at max, you are ready to get up. I think it's. Uh if you continue go karting while you're racing, say, you know, a couple guys continue go karting maybe six to ten races a year while doing a bit of time. And uh, I know if you know, the go kart, you can run on smooth hands and take every corner smooth, and I'm pretty sure you got to drive the wheels off with the small cars to go back. With, uh, I was telling my uh, cousin, I was, uh, he's only, he's nine years old, and I was telling him how to take a corner, and I told him, uh, the, the way you pull out a paw, bro, like, you, you, you don't just dump it in the glass and pull them off, and you pull everything. So you, the, the way you pour pop is you kind of got to ease into it. That's why you got to drive over it. You got to really ease into it. Yeah. That's it. Now, if you guys remember, we were never allowed to use nose cones. Not at all. That was because guys had bad habits <laughs> of using the nose cones to get under guys and, and push them around a little bit. So what they did is they took our nose cones away. We weren't allowed to use them so that the wheels were exposed. There was one more thing to look out for. And, and and work around. It was, it was another skill that you had to have. Sure, the fact that I would actually just scoop them out of the way. I know school was horrible for that. It was actually pointed up. So every time I tried to pump somebody a little bit too hard, I just go right on top of them. That's his excuse for driving. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yep. He's been working on that excuse for yeah. like, what, six years now? For uh, long. I knew it was going to come up tonight, so I, I kind of thought about it on the drive down. See, that's like, the, that's like the guy on the bench watching the game, like, man, if I was me. I would have dumped that. That's right there. You know, oh, you know, my nose cone. If it wasn't, it wasn't up like that. I would have won that race. I would have won that race. I would have won <laughs> So, going back to the young drivers in Ontario, is youth racing right now, or racing involving youth, I should say, is it as good as it's ever been right now with, with the kids coming out of karting, with the mini stock division sort of churning out stars every season the, the way it has? Uh, in our club, it's really strong. I mean, for the last six years, I've been the youngest driver every year, and there hasn't been too many rookies coming. I mean, and then, so this year, now we got some new engine rules and whatnot, and you got uh, six rookies, and they're all in, they're all in the age of 18, and, and 
it, it's it's great for the club and it's great for short term patients. David, it, it's really big right now, but uh, some of them are so good that they're overshadowing others. So like, uh, you can. Brandon McFerrin would probably be a good yes. good example. He he like he wheels the hell out of that mini stock, and there's other mini stock drivers that are his age or even younger that uh, are kind of overshadowed by that, and they're good too. It's just you, you get some of them that are just that good. That, yeah, like yeah, it has it has a lot to do with it. You cart it. Yeah, like uh, a kid that jumped in mini stock at 14 or, or 15 that hadn't carted will not be as good right out of the bat. Way over the gate, like because mini stock still falls right under that there. small amount of power. Yeah, have to make gotta use that momentum. That's that's the, the only way to. Well, there's both confidence too. It's both like a safety to know. And it teaches you to be able to be close quarters with guys at high speed. Exactly. And be able to handle your own car and put it where it has to go. Just give you confidence. Yeah. That's a that's the main thing about car. I think that's the number one reason. You're low to the track. You're there, pure driving. And on the wheel, no power steering, learn car control. Uh, do you guys think that there's drivers that are moving up too quickly? Without question. I think you're going to get that. Any Anytime a driver's wallet is greater than their skill set, you're going to have that happen. Because, I mean, racing at the end of the day, whether people want to admit it or not, it, it's a money game. And, and where you end up in the sport is not always directly tied to how good you are. And without pointing fingers, I, I think you, you could go to any short track in the province on a Saturday night and, and find a few cases of guys that are moving up way too quickly. Yeah, there's a lot of old racing right now. And, you know, it, uh, sometimes the talent is hidden behind a race car that isn't financially backed like some of the other ones. Shepard. Uh, Shepard has got to, yeah, absolutely, <laughs> without question, it's got to be the yeah. textbook response to, to a kid with all the talent in the world yeah. who, for whatever reason, can't get someone interested in financially backing his ride and it's just it's baffling but but it's not even too shadowy like he, he's my cousin so i know like kind of what he deals he has a 25 grand he had a 25 grand sponsor they they try and do whatever they can to get him on the track that means he only could compete in two races so far this year he's one bullet that means that means his percentage for this year is 100 percent and, and even with 100 percent winning percentage but back to what we're saying he, he's won 100 percent of the races he started and still no, like there. If racing was like any other sport, if you've got a if you've got a pitcher in baseball that has won every single game he started, scouts are lining up at his door to offer him scholarships, contracts, opportunities to play overseas. In racing, you've won 100 percent of the races you've started in. Can you can you get that money together to start that third race? It doesn't matter that you've won the last two, and I mean that's that's what we're saying. That there's just there's not the money available, and how far you go is not is not tied to your accomplishments nor your skill set. We don't get that much exposure in Canada. I mean, especially TV time. The odd runners, local or coach co, film the races and turn it into a 15 minute segment, but it's really hard to get um, sponsors without TV time. And I mean, YouTube helps. I mean, if you go to a sponsor and say, hey, I got. Like Lucas Oil, we get 15,000 views on our YouTube page, and every video has got your name in it. People are paying attention, we're turning heads. They like that, but social media really helps with that. But I mean, it's hard to get sponsors, and it's hard to keep them coming back no matter how we can do it. It's all levels, too. Like, you compare a driver like Poor the Joy, you know, like, where, where should he be right now? Brandon McReynolds? Yeah. Meanwhile, you got guys like Stephen Walsh and John McTelney that, you know, all the money in the world, but they just go through race cars like they're... So you, you need three things yeah. to make a big race. You need skill, you need uh, luck a lot, and you need a whole lot of money. So a lot of time skill in that. I remember speaking with Brad Keselowski about this four years ago, maybe, and he said that making it as a race car driver is a lot like making it in a band, where... You know, it, it's important that you can make good music, and it's important that you can drive a race car well. But it's also there's a lot of them. You got to be in the right place at the right time. You got to have the right look. You got to say the right thing, and that I mean that that'll sort of show you how far you can go in this sport. Is, is how you got to be able to grease a few palms. You got to have a good look. Can you sell razors or 
baby wipes or a certain kind of chocolate bar. If you could sell that product, you're, you're a hell of a lot better off than you would be otherwise if, if, you're, if you're an introvert. Great example, Daniel Block. I mean, he, he went from uh, selling a lot of his racing stuff off to uh, got a full-time job as a supercar driving instructor and uh, gotten some good sponsorship deals to do some NASCAR Canada races. So, I mean, he's just got the gift of the gab and so does his dad. They always have and they always will. And uh, Daniel's never had a problem getting sponsors, whether it's Skoka Brewery or metal metal companies that realign the molecules. And just rich guys with way too much money <laughs> on their hands, Daniel finds them. Anytime <laughs> I speak to Daniel Bois, I feel as though there's there's a used car sitting right behind me that he's exactly. trying to sell me. And just I, I try to get by on my ability to speak for a living, and I think that Daniel would probably still teach me a little bit about, about how to hold an audience and, and really command the crowd. Lane's another good example. I mean, he won a championship last year, and this year he went to work with his mouth and got himself in some seats. And once you get yourself in some seats, other owners see, okay, he trusted you with his car, try mine out. Well, one, one's getting like the right place at the right time because I got one ride, the other one. Just, it just happened a lot by luck, but yeah. you, you got to get there a lot by uh, kissing hands and shaking them all the babies. Well. You don't want to shake hands. Yeah, you, you, no, you want to you shake, shake hands, hands, hands and kiss babies. You got to make it interesting. You don't yeah. shake kiss a baby. Hands and shake. Shaking babies, that, that would probably be a good way for you to get a seat on the bench or a courthouse, not in a race car. Kyle Bush would look at him right now. I, Jared, we're just, Pat, we're, Jared Fitzpatrick. We're just, we're going to, we're going to just pass run on by, you the just, baby shaking, you just keep kissing hands. Portion, just <laughs> kiss hands, don't shake my baby. I'd prefer you not to kiss my hand if you, if you have to. New subject. <laughs> just, Davey Terry, what, what's your opinion on shaking babies? No, let's move on. Social media, you raise a great point. Daniel Bois, excellent command of social media. The th all three of you have a great command of social media. Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. How important, Davey, is social media to our level of short track racing right now? It's, it's really big because, as Max was saying, we don't get TV coverage. We don't get all that stuff. Like, this is our, we obviously, we get, we get coverage in inside track and stuff like that, but it, it's the only way for fans to really get to know drivers on a personal level and see, they, they, can, they can relate to things that they do in their everyday lives, whether it's, I don't know, everything from farming to golfing. And, that's that's what draws people in, you know. Like, take for instance, Clint Boyer. Like that guy, <laughs> like he's awesome. And before he really started going into social media and stuff like that, before Twitter was really popular, nobody really knew just how hilarious he was and, and stuff like that and the different stuff he does on it when he's not at the racetrack. And people relate to that. And they, they like. It. Yeah, I know when you're doing an autograph session, and people are like, "Hey, like, uh, I love this racing and stuff. Like, we always like to come out when you guys come to the track." And it's like. Yeah, like you can join me on board and watch watch the video from my perspective tomorrow morning. I'll have it uploaded. And they're like, awesome. Like, that's that's GoPro GoPro cameras. Cameras. the GoPro cameras have just revolutionized how a driver can connect yep. with the fan base. And I think what you what you do is amazing. I would love to see, you know, every top tier driver mount a GoPro in their camera in, or in their car. Pardon me. Start up a YouTube channel and and just run with it. I think it's great. And I've seen that progression from the even from the start of this season to where we are right now, more drivers getting on board, putting cameras, mounting them different ways, and you get different perspectives. I think it's fantastic. Yeah, I sold a camera to Steve Trendle who makes his modifieds because he, he loved the footage. And I was like, I'm getting some new ones. He's like, oh, let's take your old ones. So, I mean, those GoPro cameras have really made that possible. I mean, three years ago, there was no such thing as a GoPro camera and onboard footage was very scarce. Now, if there's a flip, a wreck, a fire, a pass, there's footage of it. I was hoping the other weekend on, there's footage of the race. Sure enough, check uh, YouTube, search yesterday, Sunset Speedway, there's the race. Someone's always watching. Absolutely. I don't know if I'm too much of a hillbilly to understand, but every time I've tried to use a GoPro... I don't know what you're about to say, but the answer is <laughs> yes, you are. Go ahead. Every time I've tried to use a GoPro, it's either died because it didn't track it right, I didn't have the right settings on it, it fell, I didn't connect it right, like, I've never had, I've, so I've had like four heats now, on GoPro. It's, the it's, it's, it's important to online. note that Lane Zardo is still under the impression that cameras can steal your soul if someone takes your picture, so <laughs> don't let that 
give you the impression of how reliable GoPro cameras are. I told you that in college. So, what I want to ask though, is there any reason why a, a driver looking to promote their product and seek sponsorship and help the growth of the sport in general should not be using social media to, to, to every every little bit of, of advantage you could offer? You have to. Even, you, you don't even have to have Twitter, Facebook, you don't have to have all that. Even just one. Just just dabble in it a little bit and just give just give fans like a taste of what you do and, and you know, put take pictures of the car when you're working on the shot. Like like people love that stuff and what even sanctioning bodies and stuff use it now. Like Oscar is huge in social social networking. Yes, Portuguese. Yes, they get well. a lot of followers on Facebook just in and that year. like Oscar, all the all the races are on YouTube. And that is that's become our instant replay, so to speak. Anything any discrepancies on the track you know, like, uh, take for instance, Sunset. Brent lost it, got in the back of me, we were running second and third, and we spun out, and uh, and we weren't really sure what happened, but then the following Tuesday, it came up online, and he sent me a text, he said, you know, I watched the video, I made a mistake, I'm sorry, this and that, and everything's cool. But before, when we didn't have that, and unless there was, like, eyewitnesses or whatnot that knew exactly what happened on track, that's when Brent just get carried and stuff like that. Now, just through social network, networking and stuff, we can we can look back at things. We can it's like a it's like a file of our racing season, really. And, and again, that, that comes up if you want to sell sponsorship yeah. for for 2014. Is it, is it not? Yeah, yeah. I mean, if you can tell a company like you have 15,000 views on the YouTube page, you're like, yeah. Instead of this year saying the Lucas Oil can make a feature win video, it'll say the Max Steel, right? It's just like, I'm sure you guys, Daniel Block, uh, how have how, uh, gave yourself notice. YouTube can a lot to do with it. I mean, these videos, all your interviews, everything like that, anything you can send your sponsor of you on film that other people can access is priceless. Well, well, like, even, even this, like, what we're doing right now, this has a lot where YouTube, and like for the views of this on YouTube, we can tweet, tweet about it, we can Facebook updates about it, so everything we can do. I mean, without social media, without Facebook and stuff, I, I, I just met Terry because of this, and this all happened because of Facebook, and then your video is getting so many hits. So, uh, I mean, without social networking, I didn't even know what an Oscar Monty was until last year, but I know they've only been around for a few years, but I mean, I didn't. I didn't know they existed. And it, it's it's really, speedways need the younger generation to survive. They need their disposable income. They need them as drivers. They need them as sponsors. And I, I, social media is able to connect that target audience, your, your 20-somethings or your early 30-somethings, to what you've got going on. If your speedway has a certain promotion, I, I really admired the way that Flamborough utilized Facebook and Twitter to hype up Kenny Wallace being at the gold rush, I mean that's that's a huge uh, a huge boost to that program to get people realizing you know what it's gonna be a NASCAR star playing Bro Speedway. Let's check that out. I saw it on Facebook. JP at, at Peterborough Speedway utilizes Facebook to, to hype up the Autumn Colors Classic year round, and it's it's just another way for you to be on your grind and, and connect with your audience. And if you're not doing it, it's a huge part of your job that you're that you're missing out on. It can it can hurt you, but it can also it can help, but it can also hurt you. Like like this past Monday's race at Flambro, the Gold Rush, like Kenny Wallace is huge on social media. Like he, Twitter, and he makes he makes about probably nine or ten buying videos a day of everything from eating his lunch to <laughs> hopping on a plane. But he had he had words about how he did not keep his position when he spun. There was no spinner spinny rule basically in place that night apparently, and he was very vocal about it on social media. And uh, there was a lot of buzz going around about the racing, the quality of racing, and stuff like that. And people read that and they think, well, it gives them it gives them their impression of the track before they even go to the track to see the racing. And so you, you also got to be careful with that. Sean Ken. Oh, yeah. it's, 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 awesome. it's, a, it's a double-edged sword. Sean Channel's video is awesome. If you haven't seen, if you haven't seen Sean Channel's post-race gold rush video, YouTube it because it's it's just fantastic. His quote at the end of that video was that 
How, how's your season going to play? We're going we're gonna to win the final four seasons here. We're going to move on. It, it, it's, it's a double answer. I have Tom Walters tell me in a bench racing video that social media is killing short track racing. Now, I, I don't agree. Obviously, a lot of my content is driven by social media, and I feel as though it's, it's easy to, to you know, connect with your fan base, it's easy to connect with your sponsors, all the reasons why we, that we mentioned above. But at the same time, someone like Tom Walters is, is frequently a target of other drivers' ire or fans chiming in on, on something that might not be too positive. So I, I guess it's easy to see why someone in that position might believe that, that social media is having an adverse effect on, on racing as a whole. And that's where you kind of got to cut it because like, a lot of people, as soon as they log on Facebook, they got a lot more cuts than they should. And then when they talk to them on the track, they kind of stutter about what they were trying to say. Yeah, it, it definitely, uh, like Tom said in the, your last bench racing video, yeah, social media definitely blows up, like he said, <laughs> it blows up rivalries. Yes, it does. So, shifting gears a little bit here, you all run three very different types of race cars. Davey, the Oscar Modified Tour is in its second season. Do you feel as though it's progressing? Is it getting better every single race, every single time you want to unload at the speedway? We hit a bit of a speed bump this season because we had a rules meeting and uh, a lot of guys voted to freeze the rule book, and which which isn't really the right thing to do in a series that was old, was not even a year old since the day it was even thought of. So that. That was kind of a drawback. Uh, there is a lot of small changes to make to the rulebook and to the to how the series works as a whole, just to try and get more cars out. Um, we definitely have the talent, we have the drivers, and there's cars out there. We just need we just need more of them to show up and run up the schedule. Um, whether it's putting more emphasis on trade motors to get the cost down, whether it's uh, limiting the series back to 12 races like it was last year from 16 that we got this year. Um, yeah, getting a sponsor for a points run, which apparently is in the works, so that's awesome. But um, but the series and Dave is working extremely hard through social networking and through merchandising to make the series as big as possible. And uh, the the thing I'm always biased. I always compare touring series to, to All Star because that. The All, -Star, the All Star Series was awesome. It was well run. It was it had three <coughs> drivers. And it was the pinnacle it was. Of, of touring. It, it absolutely, and I think that any, any tour right now could only try to, to achieve what All Star was able to do in its heyday. Absolutely. Yeah, Joe did a fantastic job with it, and I, I still tell him to this day I, I miss the, I miss the All Star days. I they they were just they were, they were the glory. One day we'll look back and say that they were the good old days, but. Um, yeah, we'll get there eventually. We just just a couple of miles in the road, but uh, we'll get there. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, I'd say it's the same with our club. I mean, we've got a good set of rules in place right now that are definitely bringing more cars out and uh, we're trying to bring the cost down. And we started to align our rules with some of the American clubs, which is getting our car count up. Like I said, we have five or six rookies this year, and uh, the past five years we've maybe had one per year, and they haven't even run full schedules, so. To get 20 cars out, 24 cars to sunset. I mean, our club's definitely on the way up, and uh, we've got a good amount of races, not too many, not too little, and uh, we're you're there to track with the same people every week. So when you're there uh, at the rules meeting, it's not like we're fighting against each other. We're all trying to bring the cost down. We're all trying to make it more affordable for each other, and we're all trying to make it as easy of a stepping stone as possible for the current. Now, super stock, the super stock division, super stock, super street stock, thunder car, whatever you want to call them, it, it's, they're by and large the same division across the province. And uniformly, we, we've seen the car counts drop everywhere. I mean, aside from Peterborough, who, who sort of revamped their division this year and, and brought it out of the crypt, and now they've got, you know, they're averaging about 16 cars as of late, other than Peterborough Speedway, every Thunder Car or Superstar division in the province has seen their numbers drop. Why is that, and what can we do to, to stop the bleeding here and get these numbers going back in the right direction later? It's, it's honestly all money. Like, for some reason, the promoters think that speed attracts fans. Well, yes, speed does attract fans to a certain point. But I've seen bombers at Audrey get 
have a better race than we saw the Ismos at Sunset, who had the fastest laps we've ever ran there. But like, if, if we drop down the cost because they're they're a great driver. Like two people who don't get shouted out enough because they're not running up front anymore are Ryan Seppel and Paul Maltese. Ryan Seppel, his first year, run, won a couple features. Paul Maltese won a couple championships at Sunset. And so you know they're pretty good drivers. But now they don't have the funding to be having the updates that we have. They don't like like there was a better car, and it's it's not the driver's fault because the drivers are good. If if you have a big wallet, you're gonna spend more money because you want to win. That's not your fault. It's the promoter's fault because we got cars right now that are way too much money. Like a, a thunder car that's over thirty grand. Like uh, four years ago, you could get a decent thunder car for five, six grand. We sold my cousin's thunder car, which was a two-time champion car, for five grand. So it, the the promoters need to work together, have a meeting with all the other tracks, and say, okay, listen, we're going way over our heads. We need rules where we match each other to a certain degree, so we can also be competitive at other tracks when we go to it. We can make it available for touring. And we need to keep the cost down because people are getting fed up with cars that are too, too, cars that have too much money going into them and they're winning all the time. Too advanced. Exactly. Uh, so it's just another, another example of drivers, and we've seen this before, being their own worst enemy. Just asking for things that are beyond their means or, or beyond their budgets. Getting a little long for, for runtime here. I want to wrap things up with a final question. And I, I love asking this question anytime we're, we're on camera or off camera because the different perspectives I get is phenomenal. Breakout star of 2013. I know that we're not all the way through the season yet. And there's so many good drivers, young and old, that, that have sort of lit the wick and, and turned things up a notch this year. Who's one driver you can point to, Davey, as the, as the breakout star of 2013? I'll get one. One driver. Can't steal match. Sorry about that. Okay. Can't steal match. Oh. <laughs> you know what? I don't. I could, I couldn't even pick one. Like I know there's lots of drivers that have definitely upped their game from last year. You got uh, like Tyler Hahn in his super late model, new car. I don't think it's brand new, but it's new to him. New to him. New rebuild. Yeah. He's he's the leaps and bounds. He's just just outside the top five in points right now. Um, Kevin Cornelius. He's rocking yeah. in that super. He's, know, he's got a broken finger right now. Even being a former limited late model track champion and, and with all that he's accomplished, I, I don't think anybody expected Kevin Cornelius to, to have the season he's had this year. I think you're, you hit the nail right on yeah. the head there. And it's awesome. Like it's awesome. Like he can wheel a race car. It, it's not all just it's not all just you know, like I'm gonna call a chassis that's easy to drive, you know. Just still gonna wheel one of those things. Back I was gonna take uh, Andrew Gressel and I don't know, I've never met the guy or anything, but through social networking, I've just seen that he's a rookie in the Super Lakes and he's got two feature wins and uh, they're second in the world. And uh, he's definitely going to be a force to be reckoned with the Super Lakes in the coming years. Now, not only does Andrew Gress have two feature wins at the time of this filming, again, by the time you watch it, he, might, he may have added more, he's led every single lap of both races he's won. He led every lap at Sol, and they led every lap at Ward Lenders. There's something to be said for for a driver that can go out and not only win a race, but dominate a race. Uh, especially at a track like Kawartha, Andrew Gressel had never raced anything faster than a Thunder car at Kawartha. Unloaded right off the truck with an absolute bullet and, and just went on and, and dominated the whole event. I think that when a driver is able to put that kind of emphasis on a strong performance, it makes it that much more impressive. That's a, that's a good choice. That's the thing with Andrew is when he's on his game, there's no stopping him. It was the same with the pro late model race. When, when he was at Delaware Speedway, I mean, he was at Delaware Speedway when Delaware had Steve Robley and Ron Sheridan and Jesse Kennedy on a weekly basis and, and Kirk Hooker and, I mean, Gressel was at Delaware when Delaware was, was by far the best roster in the province. You get to go third, so you have a little bit of an advantage here. You've been, you've been able to mull over your answer a little bit more. So. Break up start 2013, go. I can't really think of one extremely good break up start, but I can think of a couple people who don't move up their game. Like, for instance, my brother, he went from being more of a mid pack to the back runner. He's won two features, he's got a couple good seconds, and they were pretty hard earned feature wins, too. Um, there's Jason Woody, who also runs that sunset. He went from having horrible luck, like just, just really bad luck for the last two seasons, and he won three in a row. 
So I don't, it's hard to picture one breakout star, but there are a lot of people who will definitely help their game. So there you have it, folks. Oh, sorry. What? Last. We're gonna let them get the last word in. I was just gonna say I, I give a big honorable mention to Billy too, because like I was there with you when he won his first feature. Sunset like Cabana. Um, the old bump and run. I'm like. Um, yeah, you were announcing too, weren't you? Yeah, we're on the Davey's probably the best co-announcer I've ever had. My apologies to any other. I mean, Daniel Wall was very good too. <laughs> Daniel Wall was a, a fantastic celebrity co-announcer. I'm a little partial to, to having Davey Terry up in the in the tower with me. I gotta do it more often. You're rusty. Man. Come on down. We'll hang out. I'll buy you a Dilly dog. That's fine. Yeah. Uh, that Dilly burgers. I mean, I the Dilly burger would just be a cheeseburger. We have cheeseburgers. What, see, you had a good idea for a Flamborough beer garden. What would we call the beer for the Flamborough beer garden? Flambrews. Flambrews. <laughs> we call them Flambrews. That's Why no one has thought okay. of this idea, I don't know. One last topic. Why doesn't Flamborough have a beer garden? Could it be because they don't want to pay for the liquor license? Well, I mean, if they, put it, if they put it in turn three, they would have to replace the fence. Yeah, I guess. Right? You got the, the VIP tower in turn one. Turn two is your pit runoff. Turn four is where they come on the track. Hello, I'm no I, I architect. I, 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 I see them making their own moonshine as opposed. That's just what the type of track I, 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 I was about to say. I grew up around there, but half of them are already drinking, and the other half I really don't want to be around when they're drinking. So. Flam brews, I think, would be a great yeah. way to, to develop revenue. I would go and announce a flamboro just to say the word flam brews yeah. over and over again. Yeah. Hey, sure you down to number three. Pick up your flam brew. Like it just, it just, it sounds good. Half the I like people it. that go to the race would be leaving there stumbling like they just heard the leapfrog a unicorn. Like. <laughs> there you go. So on that note, we're gonna wrap this up. Keep watching the bench racing series. We're gonna have these guys on again. They're they're fantastic. Except for except for young Wayne, if he gets caught up in a baby shaking scandal, he might not be allowed to come back on. We'll have to see what happens. Social media, Twitter address. What's your Twitter handle? At Zara underscore 46. Matt. Twitter, YouTube, Instagram, Facebook. Just uh, Matt's the man. Instagram, Facebook, Vine. You don't have YouTube? Me and I, YouTube I, I do, but I don't use it too much. Where did it go from? Most of them are just videos of like Peter Bill's doing for and stuff like that. <laughs> That's still pretty good. But what's your Twitter handle? Let's see if we need to At Davey Terry. It's At Davey Terry. Follow Davey Terry on Twitter. I'm, I'm telling you. I don't talk about theory. racing, I just talk about random. It's one of my favorite <laughs> Twitter. Uh, when I look at my news feed, David Terry posts stuff. I love it. And follow me on Twitter, at It's Spencer Lewis. For all of us here at Bench Racing, thank you so much for watching. Make sure you catch episode number seven. I don't know who's going to be on it yet. It'll be someone cool. You'll love it. For the whole cast, I'm Spencer Lewis. Thanks for being with us. We're at No Baby Shaking.